Shalom brothers, shalom sisters, Bishop Nathaniel here. You know what day it is, that's right. It is Shout Out Tuesday. It's Shout Out Tuesday. And you know before I read the thank yous for the shout out donations and letters, I often like to cover a very small but very important topic. And today's topic I'm going to deal with black pastors, black leaders. Black pastors and black leaders. Um, I'm going to touch on the, of course, my dear brothers in the unknown, the black Christian ministers. I'm also going to touch on the black, well, as the world calls us, the black Hebrew Israelites. I'm going to touch on that too. I'm going to touch on a few things today. All right. So, 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 so black people have all, the question often is asked, when did black people become Christian? When did black people become Christian? Because the jailhouse talk, I, I say it like that for a reason. Jailhouse talk is that black people did not become Christians until the Renaissance era, until white supremacists dominated the planet and they gave us the Bible. Oh, how contraire, mon frere. You are so, so wrong. If you read the Bible, most of you, you got time. If you're in jail, most of you got time on your hands. If you read the Bible, I'm talking to you, committed community too, because a lot of you, yo, oh God, if you read the Bible, you will read that Christ is a black man. Revelation chapter one, verse 14 and 15. The disciples were all black. Hell, the Israelites are black. Okay, whether they call themselves today Afro-Americans, Africans, Haitians, Jamaicans, Puerto Ricans, um, Mexicans, uh, Native Americans, those who have black blood in them, those are our people, okay? Those who are descendants of what they call chattel slavery and the slave trade and colonialism, those are our people. Those are the Israelites. So now, watch this. We became Christians in the first century AD. First century AD when Christ was on the scene. That's when we be became Christians. Okay, and when I say Christians, let me clear that up. I'm not talking about these Christians of today, those that run around who hold the Bible but don't read or apply the Bible, who hold the Bible, won't keep no laws in the Bible, but will celebrate things like Christmas, Thanksgiving, Mother's Day, New Year's Eve. You know, every pagan day in the world, they celebrate. I'm not talking about those type of Christians. Those are frauds. Those are, they still sleep. All right, watch this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to jump to verse 14, where it describes him. His head, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. So Christ, the Messiah, had wool textured hair. Wool textured hair is hair of black people. You got two kinds. You have straight thin hair or you have wool afro hair. Christ had wool afro hair. Fact. Then it says, and his eyes was a flame of fire. He drank wine with moderation. Genesis 49, verse 12. Read it for yourself. Verse 15. And his feet, like unto fine brass, brass is brown, as if they burned in a furnace. So Christ was so dark, he looked like he burned in a furnace. Now, watch this. I'm going to give you some more. I'm going to Acts 13 about the disciples. Acts 13 and verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger or Nigger. 
That word N-I-G-E-R is Latin. It means black. Now, watch this. Acts 11, verse 26. Acts 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were, for, were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called Christian first in Antioch. So that was in the first century A.D. Christ was black. The disciples were black. The church was black. It has always been black. OK, N make no misgivings, no if, ands or buts about it. OK, Rome was against the church. And when I say Rome, I'm talking about white supremacy with Rome. So and the word the word Christ, as many of you know, or you, if you don't know, now you're going to know the word Christ, which is the root of the word Christian means anointed. So the word Christ means anointed. Christ is a Greek word for the English meaning anointed. All right. So when the disciples were called the Christians, they were, they were being called the anointed followers of the one the world calls Christ. So now I'm going a little bit. I want to share with all of you some history regarding, um, when the Israelites fell, watch this. Why? Let me get that first. When he, when the Israelites fell under the hand by the hands of Titus and Vespasian, Luke twenty one verse twenty four. It says, "This is what Christ says would happen. It's a prophecy, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, meaning the Israelites shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations." And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, meaning until the time of the Gentile reign is over. Right now, we're still under the times of the Gentile reigns. So what I'm going to show you historically, I'm going to show how the Israelites were dealt with by Rome when they had us as slaves, as bath attendants, um, and we were their sex tools. I'm going to show you some uh, archaeology regarding that. I'm going to show you the Punic Wars of Hannibal Barca. The Punic Wars when he took the the um, elephants in over the uh, Alps into Italy and overthrew Rome for a short time. I'm also going to show you Saint Maurice, one of the most famous generals, uh, most famous Israelite generals during the Middle Ages. So stay tuned. A textbook of the origin and history, etc., of colored of the colored people, published in 1841 by James W. C. Pennington. All right, I'm going to page 96, and let's read along, please. A stronger case still is to be found in the fact that the descendants of a colony of Jews originally from Judea to the coast of Africa, are black. So I don't want y'all to forget that. So, Because I know some of you are Christians and you have not been taught this by your ministers. Your ministers have done no research in anything. Forget what they've said. I'm going to show you true history, our true history. In brief, the image of the black in Western art from the pharaohs to the fall of the Roman Empire. All right, let's look at image 328. Plastic vase or vase, Negro head from Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor is where the Apostle Paul went to teach the gospel. Asia Minor is where the seven churches were located. It says second or third century AD. Here it is, number 328. Look at this vase, a Negro head. Now, why in Asia Minor? 
where the Greeks were at. Do they have black heads as vases? Because the Israelites were there and were colonized. They were brought there as slaves and were colonized there. So when you read about the seven churches of Asia Minor, like Corinth, Philadelphia, Sardis, places like that, and right across there you had, yeah, I said Corinth already, you had um, Philippi, these were all Israelites that the Apostle Paul was going to. A statue of a young black carrying a citula from Aphrodisius, Aphrodisius Imperial Baths, located in Paris. What's that, I-10? So this is a brother we're about to show you, I'm about to show you, from Aphrodisius, he's a bathroom attendant. Okay. Now let's take a look and see what the editors put about this picture. One of the finest of these figures is a statue of a young black from one of the imperial baths in Aphrodisius, figure I-10. Now, um, I told you these baths, um, these were like where men and women got together and orgies and things took place. And they had our people, the Israelites, in these as bathroom attendants. This sculpture, about one meter high, shows a young black carrying a citula. His upper right chest is left bare by a tunic that falls over his left shoulder. It is gathered by a cord around his waist and falls in folds that model the curvature of his legs in an extraordinarily sensuous manner, apparently focusing... The hell? All right. Whether in allusion to the alleged macrophallic character of black... Macro, <laughs> macrophallic means large uh, penis. Character of blacks discussed above or more subtle from eroticism. These figures are often classed as being objective and sympathetic representations. All right. A macrophallic Negro is seen in a mosaic at the entrance of the calderium of the house of the Menander. He wears a wreath of leaves and carries an ascos in each hand. Picture 284. 284. There's a the wreath of leaves and the ascos he's holding in each hand. These were Israelite bath attendants in 70, around 70 AD. And as a bath attendant, not only was you a slave, you had to have sex with whoever called you, whether male or female. All right, uh, we're gonna look at picture 347. It says, we may mention the slave of the baths of Tim God whose natural endowments are superb. Picture 347. Picture 347. Let's pull back. So they had, again, they had Israelites as their bath attendants, and in these baths, we were slaves to whoever had, we had to have sex with them and all kind of things. So... That's why if you ever noticed the Apostle Paul dealt with a lot of immorality questions uh, regarding um, sexuality. Like he dealt with fornication a lot, letters about fornication, adultery, stuff like that. All stems from this time period, around this time period. The image of the black in Western art from the pharaohs to the fall of the Roman Empire.
edited by David Byman and Henry Louis Gates Jr. I told y'all before, David Byman is a he's a racist piece of turd, and Henry Louis Gates Jr. must be asleep when this guy is putting uh, his notes into the book. Remember last week I showed y'all this coinage, okay? Let's this that's two seventy one. All right, two seventy one Etrus Etruscan coins. Obverse, head of black mahout. When you look up that word mahout, it is an elephant rider or servant of an elephant rider. Okay? Uh, on the reverse side is an elephant. They never give you the name. And I told y'all last week that this is or was Hannibal. This was Hannibal. And he was well known, he was famous for taking uh, war elephants across the Alps to take Italy during the Punic Wars, all right? And there's a Hebrew character right there, Hebrew letter, ancient Hebrew letter. So now, I'm going to go into another book to show you who this brother is. Who is this brother on this coin? And like I said before, who puts the image of a slave or a servant or an elephant rider on a coin, huh? Without having done some monumental feat that you became famous for. Let's go into this other book. All right. African presence, African presence in early Europe. Editor Ivan Van Sertema. All right. I'm going to page 138 where you have... The same coins that I showed you before, he has them drawn out. See the Hebrew character there? Okay. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact. All right, I'll just put it beside. There's the coins, the actual photos of the coins. Now, this author has drawings. All right. Let's go over. I'm on page 139. I'm going to start here at yet. Yet Snowden claims that these are representations of some of Hannibal's mahouts, elephant riders, while other African, African historians claim this is Hannibal himself. The Carthaginians rarely use coins or statue or stele to depict a figure not in the pantheon of gods or in the aristocratic hierarchy and would deny a figure centra centrality or prominence to indicate its comparatively lower social plane of stature. We would therefore like to know which European speculator started this story about these coins representing Mahouts. <laughs> you see that? So even this author knows that this is Hannibal himself. Hannibal. The Christian soldier, St. Maurice of Aganeum. Today in Western Europe, this African is the principal saint in parts of France, in Switzerland, Italy, Savoy, and Spain. Laurenburg, Krakow, and Kobri have him as their title patron. He is on a coat of arms of these royal houses. Let's jump down here. The highest civilian medal of Italy called the Sardinian Order of St. Maurice is named after him. All right, let me just go down here. Maurice, the African Roman general and all of his 6,000 men were black and Christian. He was ordered to a place called Aganeum, which was in present day Switzerland. His orders from Roman Emperor Maximian was to put down a rebellion. There was nothing unusual about this assignment since Europe or Gaul had been a concern of Rome occupational government for three centuries. The confusion arose after Maurice arrived. He found the rebels to be Christians 
who were objecting to Emperor Maximian's persecution of their fellow Christians. Maurice sent a message to the emperor saying he would not fight or kill these Christian rebels. As punishment for his refusal to fight and kill the Christians as ordered, Emperor Maximian brought another army to Aganaeum and killed all the soldiers, all of the soldiers, except the very few who escaped. Maurice was killed on the spot. All right, let's go. Uh, start right here. In the 14th and 15th century, so this is the 1300s and the 1400s, Judeberg received a certain number of new monuments. Among them, the Church of St. Nicholas, in which St. Maurice was particularly favored. If we judge by the fragments of the altarpiece, we're going to take a look at this altarpiece, executed around 1425. So this altarpiece we're going to look at was made in 1425 for the former high altar. The statue is, the statue in polychrome wood shows us an already familiar type of Maurice with woolly hair. Remember Christ had woolly hair. <laughs> with woolly hair and thick lips, the painted panels now set up as an enclosure for the choir give us more significant information. Here for the first time, we have a pictorial sequence that places the exotic Theban, referring to St. Maurice, among the numerous saints whose lives have been the subject of narrative cycles in art. It was logical to, to suppose that the baptism of a personage so firm in his faith must itself have been extraordinary. And it was tempting to paint that event, although no text related it. This is this is the old theme in the Aethiops, resurgent after a long progress that lies outside the scope of the present inquiry. Here, watch this. The refusal to renounce the faith, meaning renounce the faith of black Christ and sacrifice to the gods of pagan Rome is another frequent topic, as they are in many similar 15th century works the pagan gods are symbolized here by grotesque devil with bats wings. The hero's refusal to to the hero's refusal leads to his beheading. That's what we just read about when the Emperor Maximian had him put to death. The hero's refusal leads to his beheading in the presence of the Emperor, Emperor Maximian. It is important for us to emphasize that Maurice is brought before the Emperor three times and that the emperor is a negative personage, treated here in an obvious, unfriendly way. Let's take a look at image 140, shall we? All right, here we go. So there's St. Maurice. Let me pull back first so I can see the whole thing. All right, St. Maurice, this is Emperor Maximian. He wants him to renounce the black messiah and I, you know, they say devil, but I believe what year was this? Yeah, okay, this is still Antichrist time. Antichrist. I'll just word it like that. Okay. This is when he was baptized. This is when he was brought before the emperor several times. And this is when the emperor had him beheaded, beheaded put to death for refusing to carry out the emperor's ungodly order of murdering his fellow black Christians that followed the black Messiah. All right, let's take a look at 132 and 133. Y'all see that? Now, let's see who David Bindman says, one picture, image 132, and 133 are 132 Saint Maurice 133 Saint Maurice everybody Saint Maurice when you go through this book David Byman puts every black person as Saint Maurice so let me see who this guy is page 120 uh, picture 126 oh look statue of Saint Maurice 114 through 116 statue of Saint Maurice 1240 to 1250. Do y'all see St. Maurice? 
in armor, chain mail on his head, covering his woolly hair. Notice the nose, the thick lips, the very, very dark skin, black. Armor. Here's a side view. Why does, see, a lot of y'all thought uh, Christianity came up much, much later for black people. Mm -mm. All the prophets were black. All the Christians, the original Christians and Jews were all black. That's what you're looking at. All right. Picture 146. St. Maurice, statue from a niche in the central panel of the altarpiece, 1480 to 1490. Now, what I want you to take a look at now, I'm going to go over. Here's an altarpiece. It's in black and white, though. I want you to see Caesar Bourget right there. Do y'all see that? Caesar Bourget. Now let's take a look at this. I want you to look at these three fellows right here, black. Notice that they're black. You got three white women over here. Caesar Bourget in the middle. Three black guys here. And this is picture 145. Altarpiece of the high altar, wings closed late 15th and early uh, 16th century. So this is from the uh, 1400s. Remember, it was the 1400s when this was introduced, the white Jesus. But uh, my focus now are these three guys right here. Okay, now we got it in color. These are the same three brothers in color. I want you to see how they're dressed. These are not slaves. This is picture 153, let's see. Genevon, whatever. Three Companions of St. Maurice. Interior of the first wing on the right of the altarpiece of the high altar, dated 1511. So these are three companions, three friends of St. Maurice. Let's get some more. 156, Statue of St. Maurice. Cape and armor. Look at his face. Look at the lips. Look at the nose. This is a black man, not a slave. This was a general in the military. 157, St. Maurice and his companions. I want you to see all of these black men here. There's St. Maurice there. And look at all his companions. Remember, he was over 6,000 black Christian soldiers. Look in the background. Black. Do y'all see that? So don't let people fool you into believing uh, we, were, we were not Christians. We were Christians. Okay, we were in the military. I want you to see how we, how he's dressed also. He has the shield with a coat of arms with a black man's face on it, armor, cape. That's picture 137, 137 statue of St. Maurice. All right, let's watch this. When our research has been carried a good deal further we shall have to look closely into the attitudes of the people of the 13th and later centuries towards blacks and Muslims. I want you to notice how he has it worded, blacks and Muslims, blacks and Muslims, as if no black was a Muslim. But it seems like he's making a distinction here between blacks and Muslims. Let's find out why. Blacks and Muslims who had accepted Christianity. 
At present, we do not know enough to come to a conclusion. At any rate, the baptism theme spread after 1250 in Aragon, as well as in Castile. An Aragonese Fuero statue issued in the second half of the 13th century indicates the will to facilitate such conversion, baptism, and with it, the social and moral rights attaching to it was to be granted to any Jew or Muslim, Jew or Muslim, who sincerely desired to convert to Christianity. Notice here he says Jew or Muslim here, but just above he got blacks and Muslims. Do y'all see that? Can you catch on to that? Can you dig it? Blacks and Muslims, Jew or Muslim. Letting you know that the Jew is the blacks. Now this whole process is called making us conversos when they forced us to convert to Christianity. Now let's see what it means about who sincerely desired to convert to Christianity. Ain't nobody got time for that. Let's go. What we what this is 52, image 52. Fifty-two. Does it look like they have a sincere desire to become Christian? You see this guy got a sword behind this, my man's uh, head right here. And the king got a sword in front of them. This don't look like sincere conversion. This looks like forced. That's where they got the term converso. You can look it up. Then they baptized us. And we became the type of Christian they wanted us to be the kind that did not keep any commandment, the immoral kind, the kind of today. The most astonishing of these pictured strips of here has a very different bearing. It gives us a new example of the black slave christened servitor in the text. This is the illustration of Cantiga, 186 in six scenes. We give here a translation of the legends that appear under each of the scenes. This is what the picture I'm about to show you is about. How a lady was asleep and her mother-in-law sent one of her moors, one of her blacks, to dally with her. Y'all can look that word dally up, it deals with sex. <laughs> sleep, sleep around with her. How the old mother showed her son how his wife was bedded. Hmm. How they went to call upon the justice and surprised the two of them sleeping. How the justice took the lady and the moor and led them away to be burnt. How the traitorous moor was burnt and our lady protected the lady whom the fire did not touch. That's this lady with the big O and capital, capital O and capital L is supposed to be Mary protected the lady whom the fire did not touch. How the lady told of her mother-in-law's deception and all were loud in their praise of our lady. Let's look at this scene. see if I could get in close. All right, there's the uh, white woman sleeping, there's the mother-in-law, and there's her moor. This moor was her servant, her slave. Now remember, this is all a chess move to get them out of Spain. All right, so here we are. You have the lady sleeping. The mother-in-law calls her servant. There's more here. Mm -hmm. Then the mother-in-law calls her son, the son-in-law, the husband of the wife, and shows them sleeping in bed together. Then they call the justices. These were the justices. And they wake them up. 
All right. The mother-in-law is accusing them, accusing her more of having a, what do they call it? A miscegenation, interracial relations. All right. They take the more away. They, they, they tie them up, carry them away. They bring her, the, 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 the adulterous woman out too. Then they set them on, set them more on fire. But the white woman was spared torment by our lady, the ever virgin. You're right. And they stood around and mocked the black man being burned alive. Then uh, the woman uh, is set free. Mary's there with uh, little baby Cesar Borgia. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. But all of this was chess moves to getting the Moors out. And as you as you know, in 1492, under Nicholas V, they set up the papal bull where they had us go into the transatlantic slave trade. And this is no different than what you see being done in the 60s when they burnt us alive. Now, I hope you gleaned something from that brief bit of historic information. Your churches don't know it. They've never studied and they find no value in teaching it to you about who you are. They let you say little clever sayings like, I know who I am in Jesus. But, bit, but then when we ask you of all the nations in the Bible, which one do you come from? Then you get, well, Jesus loved me, this I know, for the Bible. You, you're just stupid. You're ignorant. Your pastors have done you a disservice. Your black pastors, and I'm, you know what I'm going to call them? These black pastors, these black Christian pastors are part of the black bourgeoisie. That's right, I said it. These black pastors are part of the black bourgeoisie. I'm going to open it with 1 Timothy 6 and 10. This is what the Bible says. It says, for the love of money. Now, if it's not money itself, because the Bible tells you money is necessary. Money is a defense, okay? So that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what the Apostle Paul is addressing here in 1 Timothy 6. He's talking about covetousness. Okay, watch this. 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, that's the key, which while some coveted, to covet after something means you will do whatever you have to do to get it. Whether it's you have to lie, steal, cheat, extort, you will do it to get that money. That's what Paul's addressing. That's what I'm addressing today. Let's read it again. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. That's why a lot of them don't teach that Christ is black. That's why they'll read color in the Bible and reject those scriptures. That's why they'll read the commandments and the laws and high holy days in the Bible. They will reject it and teach you about Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Dog Day, Cat Day. Hmm? And they'll teach you about feel good and give you motivational speeches. That's what it means, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What is the many sorrows? You're not getting the kingdom. When destruction comes to the United States of America and the various other lands, you black pastors, part of the bourgeoisie, you will die in the coming destruction. You and your congregants. Okay, now, watch this. So who would fall under the mantle of the black bourgeoisie amongst black Christian Pastors. Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you a few names. You have Noel Jones, Bishop Noel Jones, whose net worth is $5 million. Then you have Clifton Davis. Oh, that's my mama. Remember that show? I know a lot of, some of you may not have known he became a pastor. His net worth now is $3 million. Then you have Al Sharpton, Fat Al, Skinny Al, I don't care. He's a pastor. His net worth is $5 million. Then you have Reverend Jesse Jackson. His net worth is $10 million. Then you have Sister 
pasta, Juanita Bynum. Her net worth is $10 million. Then you have a pastor named Cindy Trim. Her net worth is $15 million. Then you have my buddy, my friend, Bishop T.D. Jakes. His net worth uh, is $18 million as of 2020. Then you have a pastor, Creflo Dollar, whose net worth is $27 million. Then you have Pastor George Foreman. Some of you didn't know he became a pastor. His net worth now is $250 million. Then you got Pastor John Gray. You know, he's the subordinate to Joel Osteen. Who could? You know Joel Osteen. So John Gray is his subordinate pastor. His net worth is $7 million. You have A.R. Bernard. You know, he's the uh, pastor of CCC Church in Brooklyn. His net worth is $5 million. You have Pastor Donnie McClurkland. His net worth is $5 million. And last but not least, in Nigeria, you have Pastor David Oyedipo, whose net worth is $150 million. Wow. Now, why do I bring any of that up? Why do I bring any of that up? They collect 10% of tithes and offering. Am I right or am I wrong? They tell you, you must pay 10% of your earnings to them. Some of them even take your W-2 forms to make sure you're paying your net worth, your, your, your not net worth, your, your, your 10%. So what am I saying? You see how the black community struggles? Imagine if these pastors, now I listed names, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I listed 13 pastors. Imagine if these 13 pastors, every Sunday, just listen good, every Sunday, just take 10% of that day's uh, tithes and offerings. Just take 10%. Put it in the bank for the upliftment of the black community. Do you know city by city, state by state, black people could be out of the projects, have homes and houses and land. See y'all, don't play with me. Don't play with me, I'm telling you. Y'all, you black pastors, let me give you another one. You, woo, I love you, but you must be corrected. Micah, let me go to Micah. Micah, watch this one. Now, these words are not my words. These are God's words. Now, there's a lot more pastors who I haven't even named. These are the ones we are more familiar with. So that's the only reason I'm mentioning them. Micah 3 verse 11 reads this regarding the black bourgeoisie pastors. The heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets, the word prophets means preachers and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. That's what the black pastors do. They, they make all this money, all this cheddar. And then say, is not the Lord among us? Isn't this evidence that the Lord is with us? Look how we live. We got jets and planes. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, you can't make this stuff up. Let's see what Christ said in the book of Revelation. Chapter three, chapter, th see, Kirk Franklin, I didn't forget about you. I didn't forget about you. You're my brother, as are all the rest. I just didn't put you down on the list today. Revelation 3, 17, watch what, well, listen to what Christ says. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, meaning poor in spirit, and blind, you're blind to the truth of God, and naked, meaning you don't, you're not covered with the spirit of the Lord. That's what Christ said. That's what Christ said in the Bible. Okay? Now, 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 I, wanna, I want to read a few excerpts from a book called The Black Bourgeoisie, written by E. Franklin Frazier. Okay? This book is a shock of self-revelation to the middle class of Negroes in America. 
Now, there's some key highlight highlighted points. Uh, thank you. Shout out to Captain uh, Shema Aya in uh, Atlanta, Riverdale, for putting me on to this book. Page 105 about the black bourgeoisie. The black bourgeoisie includes black pastors, entertainers, actors, actresses, sports, sports figures, whether you are part of the NFL, NBA, boxers, um, scientists, lawyers. I'm, when I say I'm talking about big name lawyers. Okay. So this is what he said. Now, this is not a blanket statement for all of you. Not all of you, but most of you. Listen good. This author writes, the Garvey movement, y'all know Marcus Garvey, the Garvey movement did not attract any support from the emerging black bourgeoisie. Who was part of the black bourgeoisie at that time? You had W.E.B. Du Bois was part of the black bourgeoisie and he hated Marcus Garvey with a hatred. He, and it was all based on jealousy. Watch this. This author goes on to say, as the system of rigid racial segregation has broken down, the black bourgeoisie has lost much of his feeling of racial solidarity with the Negro masses, meaning they don't relate with black people. They don't relate. Now, you brothers and sisters listening, you know, some of you may know persons in, who are part of the black bourgeoisie. You see how they disassociate themselves with us. Ask our brothers like Nick Cannon, who will put down the Israelite community and pay $70,000 to the Jewish community that was complicit in our enslavement and destruction. Fact, not fiction. This author goes on to say, moreover, their larger incomes, talking about the black bourgeoisie, their larger incomes have enabled them to propagate false notions about their place in American life and to create a world of make-believe. It is to a description and analysis of this make-believe world in which the black bourgeoisie live that the second part of the study is devoted. The black bourgeoisie live in a make-believe world like a Disney world, like a Hollywood world world. That's how they live. And that's how they think. Watch, watch what he goes on to sp speak about this thing. In escaping from identification with the masses, the black bourgeoisie has attempted to identify with the white pro pro uh, pro property classes. Let me read that again in case I study. I did stutter. In escaping from identification with the masses, masses of black people, the black bourgeoisie has attempted to identify with the white property classes. Wait, I gotta, I gotta get a scripture now. Let me get a scripture. I'm going to Proverbs. Those of you that have been studying with us, you know where I'm going in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 31. Watch what the Lord says. It reads, Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. Envy, I'm going to read it again. Envy thou not the oppressor and choose none of his ways. Mm. So let me go on back to the book. Since this has been impossible except in their minds, because of the racial barriers, those identified with this class have attempted to act out their role in a world of make-believe. In the world of make-believe, they have not taken over the patterns of behavior of the white-collar and professional white workers, but the values, and as far as possible, the patterns of behavior of wealthy whites. So the black bourgeoisie, they have, they've, they're, not, they're not trying to take over white-collar and professional white workers. They want the, the mental values of wealthy whites. You know how wealthy whites are... Uh, uh, look down on the masses of black people. Hmm? So these black uh, bourgeoisie, let me give them another name. These are your rich sambos. These are your wealthy coons. That's who they are. That's who they be. And listen, brothers and sisters, if this ain't, if this, what I'm saying don't fit you, let it roll off your back. Like, how does it go? Let water, like water off a duck's back. You know what I'm saying. 
<laughs> he goes on to say, with their small earnings, their attempt to maintain the style of living of the white property classes has only emphasized the unreality of their way of life. Faith in the myth of Negro businesses, which symbolizes the power and status of white America, has been the main element in the world of make-believe that the black bourgeoisie has created. Wow, that's some heavy stuff there, brothers and sisters. That is some heavy, heavy stuff. Now watch this. Let me go to Isaiah 28. Let me, let me take a sip of my, uh, this is my cucumber and ginger drink. It's, I'll give it, it's, I call it the Barnabas drink, Captain Barnabas. He had to hook me up with that stuff. He made that thing. You can go on my Instagram page, uh, Nathaniel 7, for that drink. It's good. Uh, I'm going to Isaiah 28, verse 15. The prophet Isaiah discusses the black bourgeoisie during his time, which also relates to this time. Watch what it says. Now, Tavis Smiley... Tavis Smiley, I believe he wrote a book called Covenant with Black America. I believe that Black America's covenant. You know what? Is that it? Yep. The Covenant with Black America is a 2006 political nonfiction book edited by the American talk show host and writer Tavis Smiley. Its theme is power relations between black and white Americans. When it talks about white America, it's about talking about the wealthy whites. Black America referring to the bourgeoisie blacks. Okay. So, I just wanted to fact check, make sure I got that thing right that day. Okay. <laughs> so, Isaiah 28 verse 15 discusses the black bourgeoisie. Whether you are a pastor, black pastor, whether you are an actor, actress, sports person, whether you're a... a, a, a boxer, uh, part of the NBA, part of the NFL, part of the soccer league. I always, we always forget the soccer leagues. Um, uh, uh, um, judges, lawyers. I'm talking about the big ones. Big, I'm not talking about you little ones, little big ones. Scientists. Isaiah 28, 15 has a message. Ah, I'm going to start at verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord. Ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Now again, what was true back then is true today. Listen good to the message. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. What is the covenant with death talking about? You've made a covenant with your oppressors. The same race that raped, robbed, and murdered us. You want a covenant with wealthy white society. That's the death. Then it says, and with hell are we at agreement? Now, what does that mean? The masses of our people are where? In hell. In captivity. Wait, I'm going to prove that. Isaiah 5, verse 13. Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, meaning no knowledge of God's law. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. So what is the hell talking about? Captivity. The lowest state in captivity. That's where we, the masses of the people, are at. Back to Isaiah 28 verse 15. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Now let me show you another example of with, 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 with hell are you at agreement. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Watch the Jeremiah verse, Jeremiah 14. Mm, mm. I'll read it. Jeremiah 14 to Judah mourneth and the gates thereof languish they, meaning the Israelites, are black unto the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. I'm reading the King James Version Bible, by the way. Verse 3. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. 
Now, wait, wait. You know what? I'm going to get another one. I just got to look for it. Give me a second. Give me a second because it just popped into my mind. Oh, Zechariah 11 and 5. Zechariah 11 and 5. Whose possessors slay them. Oh, listen good. You see how black men and black women are getting shot down in the streets left and right? Uh, you have Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor. You have um, uh, Trayvon Martin. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, we did a show, a lesson where I, I gave a huge list. But my point is this, Zechariah 11 and 5 reads this way. Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them say, blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. Here it comes. And their own shepherds pity them not. So when it says their own shepherds, our own shepherds pity us not. Meaning the black bourgeoisie who cannot relate to us, they don't pity us. It's, it is what it is. Let me go on to my life. La, 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 la. Off to Disneyland. Off to Disney World. Off to Hollywood. That's the black bourgeoisie. So back to Isaiah 28, verse 15 again. Because ye have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell, or we had agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. Meaning when hell and desolation great goes rampant throughout the American cities. You bourgeoisie say, it shall not come unto us because we live in Hollywood. We live in Disneyland. We live way over there, away from the masses of black people. We don't live around you people. For we, then it says, for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. That's what you do. You think when judgment truly comes, although you might escape, the plights and, 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 and the marchings and the robberies and the vandalism that occurs when, when black people begin to riot and white people are starting to riot now, you might escape for a moment. But the Bible says, I'm going to jump down to verse, you know, I'm going to read verse 18 in a minute. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I'm going to jump down to verse 18. Y'all can read it on your own right now. But what I want to do, I want to show you the black bourgeoisie pastors who have stood by Donald J. Trump. They pray over Trump. They want to be part of the American dream. These are the shepherds that don't pity us. These are the shepherds that don't understand the masses of black people. These are shepherds chosen by white society. That's right, I said it. These are shepherds chosen by white society and how do, how do I know that they're chosen? The media uplifts them. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Any black leader that the media uplifts and glorifies, those are not black leaders. Those are black leaders chosen by wealthy white folks, chosen by the media. They have the best interests of white supremacy. They don't have the interests of our people at all. So I'm going to show you the film. I'm going to show you the clip. I'm going to show you these guys. Just watch. So please stay tuned. Watch this. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, oh God, for this group holding up the arm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord of this president, oh God. Yes, Lord. This president who cares, oh God, not just for black folks, yes, Lord. but for every American, oh God. We pray his health. Yes. We yes. pray his strength, oh yes. God. We thank you, oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit yes. that you're protecting him. Yes. You're protecting his family. Yes, Father. And you're filling him, oh God. Yes. And we thank you for what you have done and what you have yet to do yes. through this, your vessel. Yes, yes. Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus', Jesus. Jesus. Holy Name. Amen. 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 You did ask four years ago, what the hell do we have to lose? Right. But if we don't vote right this time, we're going to have a hell of a whole lot to lose. That's right. 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 Thank that. you for an opportunity to speak about the hearts of those who sometimes cannot fight for themselves. 
thank you for this moment to be able to share our hearts with the president and his administration. Dr. King said, we cannot influence a table that we are not seated at. And so we pray that this conversation will be fruitful and productive and honoring of the best traditions of this nation. We further pray that you will continue to give wisdom and insight to our president and his leadership team to be what our nation needs to build this country from the inside out, that we will continue to be a beacon of hope and light around this world. Bless his family, bless his health, and everything that he puts his hands to do. This is our prayer and bless our time together. Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, sir. I think he's done that before. What do you think? <laughs> well, I am here. I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. I'm from a town that uh, I grew up. I'm a son of a preacher. My mother was an accountant for the local university. I was fortunate enough to go to university because she worked for the university. Um, and so my education was free, thank the Lord. And I wasn't that, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to have good grades, thank the Lord. And so <laughs> uh, I, I am a child who grew up in the steel mill era uh, and jobs left like crazy. And I've watched the city in declination. I've been fortunate enough to be all around the world and to do many things. I've never met I've met many politicians, I've met many leaders. I've never met nobody like this guy. I think for number one, it's because he's not a politician. What I've learned over the past three to four years is bureaucracy isn't as strong as we thought it was. You can get things done in a short period of time. You can make a difference. You can keep your word. And he gets attacked quite a bit, and I get it, I understand. Following behind the things he's followed behind and just done, he says what he feels. We mistake that for racism, but I met him, uh, Bruce, we were together, and, and I said, let me test this racism. I know. I'm black. No, 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 no. And I say that for a reason. I understand being pulled over by police because my car is nice. I understand some of these woes. I am not a compromising black man. I will never compromise my blackness. I'm proud to be a black man. And I will fight for black people as long as I can. Here's the deal. When I met him, he touched me with strong, you know, I'm Donald J. Trump. Uh, He wasn't timid. Then I stood by his daughter, Ivanka, and and it was time to pray. And I say, let me test it again. We were holding hands. She reached out for my hand and she said, let's pray. She was pregnant, I'll never forget it. And she held my hand. I say, a racist man's child would never. So I got several reasons why I'm gonna support him. And I'm ready to take whatever heat because it can't be hot enough because the furnace is in my favor. I believe in righteousness and justice. I don't believe for fighting for justice alone, there must be righteousness. And I don't believe in fighting for righteousness alone, there must be justice. I believe in the economic ability of this man to accomplish economics for all people, but black people as well. He's proven it. I believe that his record is proven, and if we compare it to 47 years of nothingness, I shouldn't say nothingness, I should say destruction. And if I have to prove a history, I have three years of a history that says you got opportunity zones, you have uh, uh, education opportunities, you have prison reform, 
Uh, I believe in police being uh, reformed and not eliminated. I am somebody who believes this is our time and we must take advantage of this moment. So why am I voting for him? Why am I endorsing him? Because I believe that he is going to keep his word. God bless you. Glory to God, glory to God. I'm Bishop Wellington Boone and I fully support and expect Donald J. Trump to be the next president of the United States. Yes. I, I know a little bit about his background and they, he came, his forefathers, from the Hebrides Islands. One of the greatest revivals we know in history came from the Hebrides Islands. And so what they're noted for is Calvinism. And Calvinism says that there is a manifest destiny over your life. And this man and his forefathers have said that he's a product of manifest destiny, that God determined before the foundation of the world that he would become the president of the United States. Now I can clearly say, say this to you because this is important to understand that by the fact that he has, by his fruits, which you have all evidenced by the things you are saying, you'll know them by their fruits. The priorities of scripture he has made here as the president of the United States. Remember it says that promotion comes not from the east nor the west, but the south. God lifts one up and takes another down. God made this man president. And then by the fact that he's targeted the inner cities, and all of your evidence that he's doing a great job in reaching the inner cities, it shows the favor of God is on the black community. The Bible says not many wise are called, not many noble are called, but I've called the base things of the world to confound the wise. You are a prophetic sign that revival is coming to black America and God is using this man to do it. So we're joining with him because a revival is coming. And let every man be a liar, but let the word of God be true. As we re-elect this man to be president, it is a visible manifestation that the revival is already here. Come on, let's re-elect. Continue to do a great job, Mr. President. It's your day. God bless you. See you next time. You black pastors, the masses of you, you black bourgeoisie, is truly, truly pathetic. Truly pathetic. You have parakeeted Edomite evangelicals for centuries, since the time of chattel slavery. Remember during the time of chattel slavery, uh, when we had service, church service, when they forced us to become their form of Christian, and they would choose black ministers and white slave masters had to sit there, observe, and listen to make sure we said nothing wrong. See, y'all, excuse me, said nothing wrong. So, these white men no longer have to sit in the churches today. They know that these black bourgeois, bourgeoisie pastors ain't running off the plantation. They're going to stay right there, okay? So, you black pastors, you're gonna, we're going to prophesy against the black pastor's lie. Because as the Israelites, we don't lie. We prophesy. And we're going to show you where your errors are. Your messages of motivational peace is fraudulent. Okay? And it is not biblical. And slowly but surely, your messages are unraveling. Sure, you can say the Lord going to pay, pay your, your, your phone bill. You're going to get some money, Jesus. Ah, all that crap. When our people walk outside and they see the hell in the streets, then they go back inside and listen to your Jesus loves you this time. No, all that crap. They're going something wrong because what I'm seeing on, on the streets is not what these black ministers are saying with all your, Ooh, I just got goosebumps. I feel so tingly. You're a pastor said pastor. Ooh, you're insane. You're insane. Let's go to Jeremiah 28. I know we're going back to Isaiah 28, but right now, bear with me. Come with me to Jeremiah 28. I'm going to show y'all a false prophet and a real prophet 
of the Lord. A false preacher and a real preacher. Jeremiah 28, let's start at verse 8. It reads, this is between the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Hananiah. Jeremiah 28, verse 8 begins with Jeremiah speaking. He says, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. War, evil, and pestilence. When was the last time you heard Creflo Dollar teach about war, evil, and pestilence? When was the last time T.D. Jakes preached about war, evil, and pestilence? When was the last time A.L. Bernard preached about war, evil, and pestilence? Hmm? The list goes on. I gave you a list. John Gray. Huh? Juanita Bynum. When have these black bourgeoisie pastors preached the truth of God that war is coming to America? Evil is coming to America. Pestilence is coming and is here in America. When have they done that? Not near once. Now they're trying to do catch up. They're trying to do catch up. Verse 9. The prophet which prophesied of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. But let's keep reading. Then Hananiah the prophet, Hananiah the preacher, took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. Hmm. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, mega church, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet, Jeremiah saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah, the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Mm -mm -mm. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. That's some heavy stuff right there. Letting us know a clear distinction between the true prophets of God and the prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal would prophesy of lies, of peace and motivational speeches, of money and financial tranquility. But the prophets of God would preach of what? War, evil, and pestilence against great kingdoms and countries. And that's what we have been doing. Watch our videos. That's what we have been doing from day one. And they say that we are a hate group. The SPLC have said, because you preach of war, pestilence, and evil against great kingdoms and countries, you, Israelites, are a hate group. And which, ask yourself this, which of the black bourgeoisie pastors have come to our aid? Which of the black bourgeoisie sports legends and athletes and entertainers, which of them have stood up? for the truth of God written in the Bible. Hmm? Not near one. Or you thought, we thought Nick Cannon was about to do it and he went mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Now I know what you're thinking. Christ never prophesied about war and evil against kingdoms. You don't know the Bible. 
I'm going to give you an easy scripture. Let's see if Christ followed the example of Jeremiah or Hananiah. Matthew 24, I'm going to read verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. There you go. There you go. So, 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 let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Watch this. Let me have another sip. Let me have another sip. Now bear with me. Bear with me. All right. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. It reads, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. What does that mean? Sudden, when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. Let me help you all out with that. The entire country of America will not go into total chaos, not yet, but we will have what's called childbearing pains, meaning you will see riots, whether racially motivated or based on economics, things will go up high. Then one month it's going to come down low and it's going to be all at ease. Everything's going to be almost like normal. Then something else is going to pop off and it's going to be like another child pain. Ah! And then everybody, oh, what's going on? What's going on? Going on? Then things going to calm down again. Imagine, just think about it. Think about a woman having a baby. When those contractions come, that's the word, contractions. It's, ooh, 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 ooh. Then whew, whew, it calms down. It calms down. It calms down. It calms down. Then the pain comes again. Ooh, 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 ooh. Then, whew, whew, whew. That's how American society is going to be until at the final end, World War III will break out and Christ will return, and this place will be burned with fire. You can read about that in Revelation 18. So don't play with the Israelites, brothers and sisters. Y'all better take heed to what we are saying. And you bourgeoisie pastors, you might not have known what I've been sharing with you. That's okay. As long as you're alive right now, you can still repent today. Repent now and support this truth and come to our aid. Help us in teaching the true gospel of liberation, of salvation, for the oppressed people of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because that's who we are. That's who we be. Now, on the other hand, you black bourgeoisie pastors have caused God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel, to trust in lie after lie after lie. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the uh, prophecies in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 30, and I'm going to read verse 5. Watch this. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them. You saw those black pastors praying over Trump. And listen, 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 listen. I like Trump. I like President, former President Donald J. Trump. I did like him. He made me laugh. You know why he made me laugh? Because he said whatever was on his mind. So there was no guesswork with him. You know where he's coming from. But now you got uh, alleged, uh, you got, uh, what's the name? Biden and Vice President uh, Kamala. You really don't know where they're coming from. They smile in your face and got something in your back. But the black bourgeoisie wants to appease them. Okay? <laughs> the Bible said, now listen, the only way that, I, that I, my thought regarding Trump, everybody, you got people crying, oh, Trump, Trump, Trump. He has to start a war. If a war starts with Iran or some other country, he can remain in office. But if not, he's out. And listen, let me explain to y'all how things work. There will be a, a, a book, for lack of better words. I'm saying I'm talking black terms. There's a book of programs that must be carried out. No matter what president sits in the seat, he or she, 
Because I say she because if if Jim Crow Joe, if he, if he dies, Kamala's going to be your next president. But there's a program that must be carried out. The, the president is not allowed to skip over things. No, there's a blueprint. Just like when Barack Hussein Obama was president. He could, that's, he, that's why he couldn't help black people. Sitting in a the seat, they give him his program. This is what you're going to do as president of the United States. President Trump came in. This is what you're going to do as president of the United States. Now you got Joe Biden. This is what you're going to do as president of the United States. And you black bourgeois get bourgeoisie pastors, you want to get up close. You want to get in the White House. You got your dag on. Put on your sambo face and shucking and jiving in your buckeyes. The Lord ain't rolling, ain't dealing with you. Isaiah 30 verse 5 again. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be a help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. You know, when Joe Biden got elected, black people was in the streets, uh, um, jumping up and down for joy. There was one lump, one boy, I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna show the video. Young boy, he might be around 12. He started singing, I'm free, I'm free, and Jesus, all that crap. Like a spirit of a slave just took over him. And he starts singing songs of freedom under Joe Biden. <laughs> I'm sorry. And a video got flagged for me showing the, 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 the boy singing the freedom song under Joe Biden. Listen, the Bible says again, y'all going to be ashamed. You've been trusting in this white man to save y'all. It says they were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them. Nor be a help, nor profit but a shame and also a reproach. That's why they're against reparations. That's why they have always set people in the White House who have connections with the slave trade. Oh, yes, even those of color have connections with the slave trade, not as slaves, but as slave owners. Yes, I'm talking about Barack Obama and Kamala Harris, yes. I'm talking about them, descendants of slave owners. You know, I find myself once again in the same position as President Obama. We both oppose reparations, and we both are the descendants of slaveholders. You know, descendants of slaves, grown up in poverty, victims of white privilege, all of that. But Kamala checks none of those boxes, not a single one. For starters, her father admits in an online biography seen here that he is descended from Irishmen and his side of the family owned a plantation in Jamaica complete with slaves. Yep, slaves. You heard right. Kamala is a descendant of slave owners. Likewise, she has absolutely zero biological ties to the African-American community. Now, let's jump down. Verse 12, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 12. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word. What word? You black pastors, you truly despise this word. How so? How do I know that? For example, I always give you examples. Oh, I got an example for you always. The Bible will say Christ is black. Revelation 1, 14, 15. Daniel 10, verse 5 and 6. And black bourgeois, bourgeoisie pastors go, mm-mm. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, not my Jesus. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And you will teach a fictitious Jesus to appease white supremacists. Another example. The Bible says that we are to keep seventh day Sabbath holy. We are to keep Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets, uh, Day of Atonement. And the black pastors go, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. Mm we going to do what we want to do. We're going to keep Christmas. We're going to keep uh, our New Year's Eve. We're going to keep hallelujah in the name of Jesus. We're going to keep thanks, give on, and have some onions. That's what y'all do. The Bible will say that a prophet will prophesy of evil, war, and pestilence against countries and great kingdoms. And these black bourgeois, bourgeoisie pastors go, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. we're going to preach peace, love, and hair grease. 
Peace, love, and safety to the USA. God bless America. God bless America. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So you pastors, you guys, oh Lord, you got a, you got, this one, you're going to have a day of awakening. I pray because you're my brother, my brothers and sisters. You're my people. And my prayer, I have, the Lord is using me to reach out to you in hopes that you can be redeemed. But I don't know. I don't know. Let's go back to Isaiah, I mean, Isaiah 30 and verse 12 again. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression. What does that mean? Trust in oppression. Christianity, like democracy, are two sides of the same coin. Now, what do I mean by that? Democracy and America is not a democracy. America is a republic. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, I always get it, I, I, the preamble, I don't know it, but this is a republic. Their democracy is freedom of speech, freedom of religion, unless you say you're an Israelite and teach the truth of the Bible. Now you're a hate group. Democracy, like Christianity, is an oppressive system. Very, very oppressive. When you read the book of 1 Maccabees, I'm not going to read the whole thing, okay? I'm just going to touch on it to show you. And if you don't have an Apocrypha, my advice to you is Google it. Or you can buy it on Barnes and Nobles. I mean, what's the Amazon. Watch this, 1 Maccabees. I'm just going to read one verse, or well, maybe two, because it's not in my notes, but it just popped in my mind. Moreover, 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 41. Moreover, King Antiochus, king of the Greeks, wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. Now, does that sound familiar? Sounds like the United States of America to me. Sounds like democracy, that all should be one people. Doesn't Christianity teach that in Jesus? We're all one in Jesus? Where there's neither Jew, nor Greek, nor bond, nor free, nor male, or female. We all one in Jesus. Hmm. And you have the wrong understanding on that. Let me read it again. First Maccabees chapter 1, verse 41. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. And everyone should leave his laws so all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. Wow. The past always repeats itself. We've been living or walking around the mountains from the time of when we left Egypt. Remember, Israel had to walk around the mountains because we was wicked. We have gone from captivity to captivity to captivity in a circle. And it's the same thing over and over and over. So now here we are under the United States of America. And they said that we should all be one people and all have one religion, one form of government. And many of you Israelites, you professed black bourgeoisie. You go, yes, let's do that. And you call us a hate group. We're trying to break the cycle. We are breaking the spell of sin that's on your mind. Where was I at? Let me get back. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 12. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you trust, excuse me, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness. And perver what does it mean we trust in perverseness? I'll give an example. America says, same-sex marriage is legal. It is not to be spoken against, okay? There is to be no discrimination against anyone who wants to accept same-sex marriage. And the black bourgeoisie says, yes, although in the Bible, God says, that's a sin, you black pastors refuse to speak against it, okay? That's what you've done. I'll give you another example. You know, in the penal law of, New, I'll say New York State penal law, 
adultery is still on the books. The law of adultery. And I remember speaking to a district attorney. I said, hey, is this ever enforced? And a district attorney said, although it's on the book, on the books, America has many laws on the books that they don't enforce. And he said, in order to enforce it, you would first have to begin with the president of the United States of America. I forgot who was president at this time. Mm, I forgot, but I, I got a good chuckle out of it. But I thought it was funny and strange. Uh, the, America also gives out condoms for free. Is that, are those condoms meant for us to live a moral or immoral life? Those condoms are given out for us to keep immorality alive. They're given out to high school students, junior high school students. They have them in their vending machines. Condom, 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 condom. When the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 13, for marriage is honorable above all, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. But that's not taught. So that's what it means about perverseness. Then it says, and stay thereon. We want to stay in this oppressive system. We want to stay. When I say we, I'm not talking about myself or the Israelites. I'm referring to the black bourgeoisie, the masses of black people that believe in the black bourgeoisie. Whether you are a pastor, an actor, a sports uh, announcer, a sports, uh, sports, an athlete, whatever, they follow you. That's what it means, and stay there on. Then, let's go back to Isaiah 28. I almost forgot. Isaiah 28, verse 18. Remember, we read earlier about the covenant black people made with death and, and with hell of that agreement? Watch the prophecy of that agreement. Isaiah 28, verse 18 now. And your covenant with death. Now remember, the your there is the black bourgeoisie amongst our people and the masses that follow them. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. When destruction rips through America, all of you black bourgeoisie brothers and sisters who've made a covenant with death and with hell you at agreement, when destruction comes, you will be caught up in it. And those that follow you too. Fact. Let's go on. Verse 19. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, uh, by day and by night. And it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. What does that mean? It shall be a vexation only to understand the report. The words that I'm speaking to you, you're gonna, the Lord's going to make sure you retain this teaching in your memory. And when you catch in hell because you've been so rebellious against the truth, when you, your families and your followers are catching hell, when the destruction comes to the good old U.S. of A, Babylon the Great, you're going to remember this day. You're going to remember this lesson, this teaching. You're going to remember. Now, what I want to show you now is the Christian whites, the evangelical Edomites, who prophesy lie after lie after lie. And this is who black evangelicals pattern themselves after. I want y'all to take, pay very close attention. The first thing that these uh, evangelical Edomite Christians will do after they prophesy lies, once they realize that the lies is not working in the name of Jesus, there will be remnants and groups of them that will start to cause revolts in the country. Black militias will rise up in the name of Jesus. They will get on their knees and pray to a white Jesus, who doesn't exist, by the way. And they will begin to destroy and revolt in the cities. I'm going to show you that. Their goal ultimately is to destroy black people. But black people... And it's easy to destroy black people, it's easy. But they realize the first group they gotta get are those liberal whites. They gotta get rid of groups like Antifa. I'm gonna show you this clip now. Pay close attention. I said, Lord, Joe Biden don't need to be president. And just like this, just like if you'd answered me, he said, he won't. Will President Trump, from what God is showing you, win his second term? 
Uh, yes, it is, is for sure, uh, Sid, that God wants uh, President Trump in. God has already sealed the results of this election. He has sealed it in heaven. Tracy, is President Trump going to have a second term? Well, it's the same thing similar to Kevin, yes. I want to say without question, Trump is going to win the election. Trump will win. He will be president of the United States. He will sit in that office for four more years, and God will have his way in this country. The Lord said to me, I am going to give your president a second win. Whoa! In the third dream, he said, I need for you to be my running mate for my second election. And the Lord said, because what I intend to do through him, it will take two terms to do. And I need for you to run with him in the spirit to see that everything is removed out of the way that would hinder that so that he is not only finishes this term, but is reelected for the second term and can fulfill the mandates of God upon his life. You said this one that I shall raise up from New York. I will give him two terms. God's in control. He controls everything, and I believe that involves Donald Trump being president for the next four years. Will it be an eight-year presidency? Absolutely. Absolutely, we will. Uh, you're sure about that? Yeah, I'm sure about that. Wow. He is the one. Joe Biden's going to win this electoral vote. Joe Biden is a winner in Vermont. Joe Biden will win Virginia's 13 electoral vote. Joe Biden, he is the projected winner. Joe Biden is the apparent winner. Joe Biden as the winner. Joe Biden prevailing in the state of Georgia. Joe Biden. Joe Biden, the projected winner of Illinois. Joseph R. Biden Jr. is elected the 46th president of the United States, winning the White House and denying President Trump a second term. Well, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha. Ha, 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 ha. Are you kidding me? Let me tell you something. Every Christian, every pastor out there that voted for Joe Biden last night, you have bought a curse upon yourself and your family, your children and your children's children down to the third and fourth generation, and you need to repent. These people are evil. I don't think you guys understand. They're evil. You vote these liberal leftists in and they worship the devil. They're evil. You talking about the Illuminati? They are the Illuminati. They're evil, wicked people. This is who they are. They need to go to jail forever, ever, for the rest of their lives. But the day is coming. You can't test God for too long. Joe Biden is not the president-elect. He never will be the president of the United States. I'm telling you, I promise you, with full, complete assurance and opinionated authority, Donald Trump won by a landslide. Quit freaking out. Quit fretting. I'm betting the farm on this one. Lord, if it be your will and if it be necessary, another election, another voting day, whatever it takes under your kingdom, oh God, to bring With the will of God. Strike and 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 strike until you have victory for every enemy that is aligned against you. Let there be that we would strike the ground for you will give us victory, God. I hear a sound of abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of shouting and singing. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. We must not let the devil have the inheritance of this country. The angel of the Lord is going to go forth for America. Why? Because the president can't fight now. You get what I'm saying? He can't do it. So the Lord is sending his angel.
For I hear victory, 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 victory in the quarters of heaven, in the quarters of heaven. Victory, 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 victory. For angels are being released right now. Angels are being dispatched right now. Amanda, ata, ata, rata, dede, baka, sanda, ata, ambo, osa, tata, rite, eke, banda, ata, rite, didi, asha, da. Paula White King, that woman has spiritual insight. For angels have even been dispatched from Africa right now. Africa right now. Africa right now. From Africa right now. They're coming here. They're coming here. In the name of Jesus from South America. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. From Africa. From South America. Angelic forces. Angelic reinforcement. Angelic reinforcement. Angelic reinforcement. Pika hata anda ata ora bata rata anda eke eke manda rasata. The Lord says, Son of man, prophesy unto Wisconsin that it will go red for Trump. Prophesy unto Michigan that it will go red for Trump. Prophesy unto Pennsylvania that it goes red for Trump. Prophesy unto North Carolina that it goes red for Trump. Wow. Prophesy unto Georgia that it goes red for Trump. Prophesy unto Nevada that it goes red, red for Trump. Prophesy that the media will cancel the assignment to, to call the election. The Fox News decision desk can now project that former Vice President Joe Biden will win Pennsylvania and Nevada, putting him over the 270 electoral votes he needs to become the 46th president of the United States. Why are you attacking the prophets? No! I really want to apologize, sincerely apologize, for missing the prophecy about Donald Trump. Uh, I prophesied um, that Donald Trump would be president. And then later on, I prophesied that he would um, not be impeached and the fact that he would win another term. And I was completely wrong. It doesn't make me a false prophet. The Associated Press said that Joe Biden is president. Ha! <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to be president. Mickey Mouse is going to be king. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. For I hear the sound of victory. 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 Paula White King. That woman has spiritual insight. We push back every agenda that would that would release a premature satanic agenda in the name of Jesus. Anything that would that would be of an antichrist spirit, we break it right now in the name of Jesus. Every antichrist spirit, we break it right now. Every antichrist agenda that is being pushed, we break it. We override it. We overturn it. We overturn it. We overturn it in the name of Jesus right now. God, we just declare that you will keep the feet of Pope in his purpose and his position right now. We stop and we override the will of man for the will of God. That woman has spiritual insight. So this is a word from the Lord and he's not happy with what's going on. He's not happy with some of these things that have been decided and he's not happy with the, the opposite direction that he wants to go. And he's saying, watch me work. Yes, amen. Lord, we're going to see you yes. work in this. Last night, and it's not getting a lot of coverage, but last night, the Proud Boys in Washington, D.C. basically attacked a black church and tore down a Black Lives Matter banner from that church. You can see video of it. It's pretty disturbing, frankly. They're tearing down the banner. They're lighting it up. They're saying whose street our street and basically what these proud boys some of trump's most loyal supporters the people that trump told to be on standby for him and they were at the you know these these insane trump rallies yesterday in washington they were going around 
to a black church and defacing it. It's utter, utter disgusting behavior. It's awful to see. And look, we have to be clear here that the message could not be any louder. It could not be any more explicit. You have Trump supporting Proud Boys going to centers of the black community. And for many people, that remains the church tearing down their banners, going onto their property to deface it, saying to black people, to black Christians in particular, you do not belong here. Your churches do not belong here. Your messages do not belong here. Your insistence that your lives matter doesn't belong here. We belong here. Whose streets? Our streets. And so in essence, in a community like Washington, D.C., which has a lot of black people and a lot of black churches who have the gall to insist that their lives matter, according to core parts of the Trump base, like the Proud Boys, they do not belong there. They do not belong on these streets. And this cannot be disconnected from the hypocrisy of the American Christian, the American religious right, because they will go on for eons, guys, for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks about a supposed war on the faithful, about a supposed war on good American Christians. They'll talk about the war on Christmas. They'll say that, you know, all oh, leftists want to get rid of Christmas trees. Leftists won't let workers say Merry Christmas at Walmart. Leftists won't let you have Christmas parties at work. Leftists want everything to be happy holidays. All of these things are being done by the left to hurt Christian expression. And they want to take the Bible away from your children. And you heard it at the Trump rally yesterday that, you know, it was deeply intertwined. I'll put a link in the description of my video with Christian expression, that the idea was that this was not just an election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, but an election between the good Christian faithful and everybody else. And you know what everyone else means, right? It means the atheists and non-Christians and secular people and liberals and socialists, etc. And that was the narrative from the Trump rallies. But the real thorn in the side of a lot of these Trump supporters is that African-American people, many of them, have devout, historic, very prominent Christian communities. And they, in some ways, really throw a whole wrench in the thing. Because we have to be clear that all of these people that supposedly are defenders of Christianity, it is they and their movements historically that have attacked African-American Christian communities. Look, Dylan Roof, you know, I don't need to mention what he did again. His horrific action happened in a black church. That happened in a black church. It was targeting African Americans, yes, but particularly it cannot be separated from the black church, from the black evangelical Christian community in the United States. These sorts of things are connected. They're not going to want to hear that. Proud Boys aren't going to want to hear that. Trumpers and Republicans aren't going to want to hear that. But the direct connection is there historically and today between the attacks on the black church and what happened in Washington. They do not want you to care about Christianity unless it's white Christianity, unless it's white conservative Christianity. It's the only kind that matters. Fox News will not cover this as a war on Christianity. They won't. Even though this is the closest thing to actual Christian persecution you will see in the United States, it's almost always white Christians going up and defacing black churches, either directly or indirectly. That is the only established history of Christian persecution in the United States, going all the way back to before the Civil War, when for a long time, you know, the owners of black people didn't want them to have Christianity in some cases. They either forced it on them and in some cases forced them away from it or tried to ensure that their Christian messages did not preach universal equality, did not preach justice, did not preach an end to segregation. There's no reason why we should forget that Martin Luther King was rooted in a black Christian tradition. I just, guys, I, I, I can't get over this. This is the American religious right attacking black churches.
Damn fucking time out of here. Did y'all see that? Did you see that? Did you hear what was being said? Listen, listen, listen. Black people, 
These are the last days. These are surely the last days. And as I said before, the goal of white society is ultimately to re-enslave black people. To re-enslave us. And black people, we are 100%. Listen to what I'm about to say. Black people, we are 100% disorganized. I've told you that many, many times. And it begins with the black bourgeoisie. Whether you are a political bourgeoisie, an entertainer bourgeoisie, a scientist, um, a, 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 a actor, athlete, whatever. You live in a world of make-believe. You live in a Disney world in your mind. That's how you live. Whether you call it Hollywood or whatever, you totally separate yourself from the masses of black people. So when you see things like the clip I just showed, you're in your Hollywood going, oh well, don't affect me. Then the black church. Now the ministers, you live someplace else. The black church is run by over-emotional, effeminate men or and or women. They too live in a world of make-believe with a white savior. So they'll say, see things like what I just showed and go, c'est la vie. Now, I would be wrong if I didn't mention Israelite leaders. Now, Israelite leaders, they are not part of the black bourgeoisie. They're not. However, they are disorganized, 100% disorganized organized. So now let's get into the reading of the letters. All right. All right. All right. So now we're going to shout out, give some shout outs to the letters from brothers and sisters. And y'all got to learn to put your name on some of this stuff. Again, this is cucumber and ginger with a brown sugar, I believe brown sugar's in that. Yeah. Delicious. Now this was done on a United States Postal. Now you could probably, I don't know if y'all can see the handwriting. Because there's no name on it. All right. It says, Dear Bishop, thank you for all you and the brothers and sisters of IUIC do in spreading the word. Please pray for the continued health of our family as we pray for you and all of Israel. Most high in Christ, bless you all. Much love to you all. Sign, no name. All right. Then here's, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's two pages here. Now I done told y'all about these long letters. You better catch my attention quick. Let me see. First and last long note. Smile. Pre-Sabbath to Friday Eve, November 20th. Who wrote this? Shirley and Walter P. Alfreda P. So that's from Shirley, Walter, and Alfreda. Shalom. Most High in Christ, bless. Deacon Asaph, family and, and, and our Israelites with the New York camps. The pop, the, you put your last name. Thank God for men like you and our Bishop Nathaniel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your messages to us, ex thugs, <laughs> from COGIC, Church of God in Christ Religions, have found our way to recovering from sleep. All praises. Deacon Asaph, shout out to Deacon Asaph, by the way. Deacon Asaph, we cry in our home, now knowing the truth was hid from us as they raped our pocketbooks for tithes. Sirach 12, verse 3. We are not depressed anymore when our time comes to sow arms to godly men of God who do wonderful things on earth for us. Tell us the whole truth with lots of compassion. Raw. 
taking the skin off the bones to free us from sin. Not like those mags, oh, mags, men of, mogs, men of garbage in these mega churches. That's funny. These mega churches of lies. We have had enough of that bad food. Deacon, do not wrong, do not worry about those nappy headed niggas. Just keep serving those of us who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness. I've been blessed to get rid of that rejection spirit that had me bound, almost destroyed. Please do not stop the truth. We will buy the CDs if they keep trying to block us. Thanks for all the information you sent to help us understand protocol, the order of how being an Israelite in duty along with our spiritual growth. Please let our bishop know. I'm reading your letter. Please let our bishop know. Yes, it makes us feel good when he takes the time out on his Tuesday shout outs to thank each one for alms. I love him for that. However, what motivates me to bless our purpose is scripture in Romans 12 verse 1. It's our reasonable service to help our leaders to build the kingdom for the Most High to collect, to collect us soon. Deacon Asaph, you and the bishop are so passionate about this truth as my dad was. Sometimes people will hate you. This should let you both know you're doing well with the Most High, for they hated him too. Just do not let them have you drink your own bath water. Ooh, smile. <laughs> Shalom. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Walter Shirley Alfreda. Thank you so, so much. And I'm sure Deacon Asaph, I can speak for him. He thanks you also. All right. This is from Ethel. I, I can't read the last name, but here's the handwriting. Hopefully you can see it and recognize your handwriting. It's for some, it says, Dear Brethren, B-R-E. That looks like a D to me. B-R-E-D-A and brethren. But I think you mean brethren. All praise to the Most High for the work he has set forth through IUIC ministry. You guys have opened up my eyes tremendously. I listen to IUIC every day on my way to work. When I wake up in the morning, making breakfast before bed. Thank you. Sincerely, Elthol. Elthol. No. Thank you, family. Thank you. All praises. All right, then. This one is from Sister Lorinda E. from California. Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel and leadership. I pray this letter finds you and your families in good health. To be direct and to get straight to the point, I need to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all you and the leadership do. You know, let me show the letter. All right, so you recognize your handwriting. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you and the leadership do, sharing your time, knowledge, and wisdom with the true Israelites, continuing always without ceasing. You have brought much understanding, newness, and gladness, joy to my heart, mind, body, and soul within the last two plus years, as opposed to living 50 plus years in lies, darkness, death, and destruction, Christianity in parentheses. I will continue to pray for you, mighty prophets, and pray that one day I may meet you all in person as it would mean so much. Also, I request that you pray for me as I have partial paralysis in lower extremities. Thanks in advance. May the Lord continue to bless and keep you all. Stay strong in the Lord. Know that you all are loved and appreciated. Now, you wrote a PS there, and I did want to read this on Shout Out Tuesday. I did want to read it to thank you and definitely let you know we're praying for you and um to the sister in um washington dc we did reach out to the brothers and sisters there and they're going to send um a group of sisters there to assist you and help you in whatever you need all praise and sister lorinda lords will come pass over i pray the doors are open come pass over and we can all fellowship this coming passover in april Alrighty then. This is from Sister Robles. 
Here's your handwriting right here. Okay. It says, Most High in Christ bless you all, leadership and family. Pray you all staying safe out there. Please keep praying for my family and me. Here's my little help to IUIC. Like always, take care and stay safe. You left your phone number. I'm going to make sure Deacon Asaph gives you a call. Shalom, Bishop. Please accept these arms to help spread this truth. Let's take the kingdom from Benjamin P. All right. Here's another one. This is from Sister Catherine. Shalom leadership, thank you for being a great watchman over the nation of Israel. You are always in my prayers. Pray for my family. Yes, Sister Catherine, thank you so much. All right, this is from I believe that this says Valerie. Last name starts with a G. Let me hold it up. Dear Bishop, may God bless you and family. Thanks for your teaching. Please pray for my son, Mr. Malik. He is going through stomach sickness. Thank you, Bishop, for all you have done for us. P.S. Just a little to help. All right, Mr. Malik, I'm definitely add you to the prayer list. I'm going to go through these letters again. Where's my sister, Lorinda? Got to put that one separate to the side. All right, this is from Audrey H. This is a small letter. Shalom, most high in Christ, bless you, bless you all. Here is my small contribution to help gather the 12 tribes of Israel. Audrey H. Thank you, Audrey. All right. This is from Jay Vaughn. Jay Vaughn, little note. See, this is how brothers do. They write little notes. We don't give these long, drawn-out things. Well, most brothers, not all. Just became a brother at one of your great schools. I know, these, I know this may be a, a lot to ask for, but if you remember next time you fast, please pray for me. I pray to get a zeal like you and other leaders in IUIC. Most high in Christ blessed, Jay Vaughn. Yes, Brother Jay, all praise. We're going to pray for your zeal. Zeal is very important. And like I always say, you may not always be motivated day by day, but you must always be disciplined day by day. It's like on a job. You know, when you first get that job, you got that zeal. You're there, you're there, you're on time. You're doing this, you're doing that. And as months and years go by, you don't have that same zeal. Sometimes you show up late. Hey, Harry, how you doing? Good morning. How's the wife and kids? Yeah, okay. Or when you go to the gym. You sisters know what I'm talking about. You're doing your, your exercises. you you excited in the beginning. But then as weeks go by to a month, you're like, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to eat right to the little lettuce here. Little pen. So again, you may not always be motivated, but you must always maintain discipline. All right. Here's another one. Got a letter here. It's a card. Please come into our lives for all sorts. No. People come into our lives for all sorts of reasons. Some teach us life lessons we never forget. Some nurture us and help us become better people. Some simply love us with all their hearts. Some people are a lesson. Some people are a blessing. And some people are a downright cuss. <laughs> all right. Then there are people like you who do all those things and more. Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel. Hope you and family are well. Thank you and leadership for your prayers. My family made it through COVID. Hey, hey, hey. The, this is another round coming around. Why do you think I'm drinking this um, ginger cucumber drink? 
because COVID is back. This white man, you know, they had to put it back. I'm sorry, I'm, y'all bear with me. They put that stuff back in the air. The, the numbers is rising again, people getting sick, and now they got the damn vaccines out. Yeah, okay. All right, I digress. I know it's from following the teaching and obeying the commandments. No, this card expressed what I think about leadership. You're the best. Love you all, family. And closes my arms and booster club. This is from our sister, Sherry H. O. Thank you, Sherry, so much. All praise to the Lord. And you also appreciate it for your labor of love and hard work. Thank you, Sherry. All praises to the Lord. All praises. All right. This is from Sister Becca. I know it's a sister based on that handwriting and the name Becca. I don't think there's too many brothers named Becca. Hi, family. Here's a donation for the body. Wish I can fellowship with you all. I don't have a school in the city that I live. The school that is in my area is like 250 miles away, which is in New Orleans. Wow. Plus, I don't have any transportation, but I enjoy watching y'all on YouTube and been watching since 2016. Now, in case y'all don't know, Sister Becca and others, YouTube is starting to flag our videos, take down our videos. But we have a video section on our website, Israel United in Christ. Go, we have a video section where you can see all of our videos. And that's our just in case YouTube finally hits the button at the behest of the Southern Poverty Law Center and shuts us down completely. All right. This here is from... Brother Yavin. He got the little crest there. I like that. He got the 12 for 12 tribes there. This is Yavin Ben Israel. Thank you, Yavin, for your donations as well for the Booster Club. All praises. Shalom, Be Shalom Bishop. Most High in Christ bless you and your family. Bishop, you all right? I appreciate you, sir. What I appreciate the most is your experience in this truth. There is no substitute for experience. Then you have surrounded yourself with historians. I'd like to hear the history of how this journey began for all of you. You and the deacons can tell us stories from the beginning at the old schools. I don't really care about the mistakes that were made in the past, because if you don't make mistakes, how can you learn and grow? That's a fact. And who hasn't made mistakes in this life? I think I'd rather take 20 lashes than for the world to see the mistakes I've made. Ha ha ha. But everyone has gotten back up and pressing forward, trying not to repeat the same mistakes. That's very important. That's what brings me back to your experience. When problems arise that you have seen before, it's easier for you to deal with them without panic or fear. There is a comfort feeling that comes over you when you have seen a problem before and dealt with it successfully. You have the greatest SOP, the KJV Bible. SOP, you have the greatest SOP. SOP. S-O-P. I'm sorry, Evan. I'm at a loss. It might get me in a few minutes, but this second, I can't figure out S-O-P. Uh, you have the greatest S-O-P, the King James Version Bible, behind you, as, behind you as well. It has laid out the same problems that happened in the past and how they were dealt with. This is so we can learn from them because we know that history just repeats itself. I do believe the Most High gives some of us a spirit of recognition too, because you have to be able to recognize situations that will lead to problems before they manifest. That also comes with experience. When you say to yourself, I've seen this play before and it doesn't work out well. <laughs> and this is how we're going to deal with it. I can share my recognition abilities with you. I had experience with dealing with fake religions to where when I started watching you, I immediately recognized this was the truth. It made sense to me. I read Deuteronomy 28, 68 before and said, that sounds like us, but you and the brothers put the puzzle together for me. I used to say, where are the black people in the Bible? I read about the Egyptians and Moses married an Ethiopian, but back then I was just talking about black folks because I knew we weren't Nilotics. When those brothers would come to the hood, we were like, they different and not in a good way, ha, ha, ha. Stay Israel-focused, because Christ is returning soon. Shalom. Thank you, Yavin, 
All praises to the Lord. Again, thank you for your donation, Yavin, as well. All right. We want to give a shout out to Walter P. Thank you, Walter. We want to give a shout out to Elpha, Elpha J. Thank you. A shout out to Dave and Katrina P. Thank you. Charlie W. Jr. Thank you. Mm, you didn't put your name on this. But you are located in Racine, Wisconsin. Thank you. I want to give a shout out and thank you to Sandra G. of South Carolina. Danique A. of South Carolina as well. Benjamin P. Thank you so much. Carmen R. Thank you so much. Catherine. Thank you so much. Valerie G. Thank you. Mm. Monel S. from our Montreal school. All praises. This is for you. I know what it is. Audrey H. Thank you. Jay Vaughn. Thank you so much. Uh, Melissant E. D. Melissant E. D. And Merlene A. Thank you so much. Sherry H. O. Thank you so much. Sherry H. O. Thank you. Uh, C. Kemp. Thank you, C. Kemp. Rebecca M. Thank you, Rebecca. Ernest G. Thank you. Eric G. Thank you. Marsha H. S. Thank you, Marsha. Pelalila I. Thank you. Lorinda A. E. Thank you so much. Sheila K. And Jada R. Thank you so much. Mm, again, this sister or brother, I, I can't tell, from Racine. And I want to thank, last but not least, Samuel E. of Nan Nanticoke. Nanticoke. All praises. Thank you so much. So, brothers, sisters, you know I love to say, let's stay faithful. No, nope, I said it wrong. Here we go. Let's stay healthy. Let's stay healthy. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay focused. But most of all, let's all of us stay in the spirit. Most high in Christ, bless you all. Love you. Shalom. We used to scream black power while Haram was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling These are how our men repented at heart The scriptures is proof IUIC, we deliver the truth